Well, good day to everybody. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon you're going to be looking at this, so I just thought I'd start with good day. Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is all about presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. As you know, a lot of it, a lot of what you do is all in how you present it. Are you confident? Are you shy? Are you insecure? Are you positive? Are you negative? And when your presentation, it means a lot to the audience. You know, are they going to believe you? Now, there is something called communication apprehension. I personally like to still call it stage fright. Now, a lot of communication scholars go, well, you are performing, so it's not stage fright. And I said, no, you are performing. Anytime you get up in front of people, you are doing a performance of some sort. And there is something called the Personal Report of Speaking Anxiety on page 216 in your book that will help you understand how much anxiety you have. But without going into great detail on that, that you can figure that out in the book. Let's talk about ways to reduce your anxiety. As I've told you all many times, before I teach a class, I'm nervous. I'm afraid that I am not going to present the material in a way that you will understand it. And so you're never going to get rid of the anxiety completely as long as you care about what you're doing. But ways you can reduce it is to practice. Now, I've given this lecture on Chapter 10, oh, I don't know, or delivery, shall we say, probably a couple of thousand times. And each textbook is a little bit different on delivery, but they all cover the basic things. The most important thing you can do to reduce your anxiety is to practice. Not read it. Da, 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 da. Practice it. Pretend you are giving the presentation. And go through every bit of the presentation just like you would if you were in front of a live audience. Practice in front of a mirror. Practice in front of your friends. Practice in front of your significant others. <clears throat> but practice. Don't wait to the last minute to write your presentation and then give it. Or don't wait to the last minute to practice it. You know, well, I, I got to give this presentation tomorrow, so I'll practice it today. You need to practice long before that. Something else that you can do is visualize success. Now, most of you went to high school recently. And when I was in high school, a long time ago, they had something called pep rallies. And for my grandchildren, I understand they still have them. Have you ever heard of Pep Rally saying, we're going to lose? No, you haven't. Have you heard of it? You know, well, they're going to kick our... No, you haven't. It's always positive. It's we're going to win. We're going to beat them. They might have a winning record. You might have a losing record. You maybe have never won a game in, in the last year. But when you go to a Pep Rally, it's going to, we're going to win. And you have to do the same thing with yourself. You kind of have to have your own little personal Pep Rally. Visualize success. Don't visualize failure. See yourself doing it right. Remember that the audience wants you to succeed. I mean, you don't sit and listen to somebody give a presentation and hope they're going to screw up. Unless maybe you're the, you know, like you're both candidates for, for an elected position and, and you want them to screw up. But in general, your audience, not, not your opponent, your audience wants you to do well. Slow, deep breathing. A lot of people get so anxious and so wrapped up and they get to really talk and they talk fast and they don't take deep, take deep breaths. And, 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 and it messes with your head if you don't get oxygen to it. Now, there's a couple of different ways that we can do delivery. There are manuscript, which is um, you're reading it from a teleprompter or you're reading it from a book. A lot of you believe or, or have this strange belief or, or feeling that when you get up and give a presentation in my class, you're going to read a speech. You're not reading speeches. This is public speaking, not public reading. Memorization. Well, and go back to manuscript real quick. You want to do manuscript if you're the president declaring war on another country and you have to have every word exactly right. But... When you are doing a, a presentation for something else, you don't need that exactness. Memorized. Um, we've all seen bloopers at the end of movies where people get, get paid millions of dollars to make movies screw up their lines. 
you're not getting paid a million dollars. You're not going to memorize it exactly. And when you try to memorize your speech and you mess up, it messes you up mentally because you're trying to get back to where you were supposed to be. An impromptu speech is um, you just won a baseball game. And you walk out of the locker room, somebody said, what was the turning point of the game? You didn't have a chance to, to prepare for it. It's off the cuff. And that's not what we want in public speaking. Finally, we have extemporaneous speaking. That's what I want you to do. Know your material well enough <clears throat> Excuse me. that when you stand up in front of us, you need a keyword outline. You just need one word to tell you what it is. For example, and I'll post my notes on, on Cougar View. For example, it just says extemporaneous. I know what it's all about. I know what I need to talk about. Now, we have a couple of different things that, that we also deal with. Paralinguistics. Paralinguistics is the, the volume and the pitch of your speech, the rate and the fluency. You know, I tend to talk real loud all the time because I went so many years without hearing aids. And when I get to a point I want to stress, I talk softer. I change the volume. Sometimes I get excited, we talk real fast. And sometimes we slow down. And, and the fluency... And yeah, this, this kind of bothers me. A lot of people um, tend to make assumptions when they hear somebody isn't fluent, say, shall we say, in English. But I've listened to a lot of wonderful speakers in English that it wasn't their first language. And a lot of times they'll get stuck because they're trying to think of that one word that they know for chair. But we could take chair, stool, bench, recliner. I mean, we've got all kinds of words that we could use in, in our lexicon because we grew up with that language. But a lot of people that aren't fluent in English, it's, English is their second language, they will know one word for one thing. And when they can't think of it, they get stalled. And, and a lot of people look down on that. They well, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. A lot of times, fluency causes more problems with the audience than it does with the person giving the presentation. Nonverbal behaviors. Uh, gestures. You know, I use my hands a lot. We have gestures all the time we talk. And, and we, we were discussing something. How big was it? You know, how small was it? How tall was it? <clears throat> Which direction was it? So <clears throat> we use gestures all the time. <clears throat> Eye contact is something that is is culturally specific. You know, when you were growing up, your mama probably said, look me in the eye, I can tell when you're lying. As a parent, I can tell you right now, we really couldn't tell when you were lying, but we scared the bejeebas out of you so much that you believed we could. And so you wouldn't lie to us. But we, we tend, we want people to look at us in the eye. Now, um, a lot of Asian countries... If, if you look in the eye of an older person, it's insulting. You need to look gaze away from them. So when you're dealing with different cultures, you have to understand there's, there's a difference in, in how they believe eye contact should be. Movement. You know, one thing I hate about giving these presentations via video is I'm sitting in this chair, and I like to move around. You all know that. You've seen me give presentations. But I like to move around. I like to be comfortable. And I like to relax. Attire. What are you wearing? You know, if I was giving a presentation at um, down on the Chattahoochee River and I had my suit that I normally wear, you'd probably think that I was kind of crazy. Oxbow Meadows, you know. But out of Oxbow Meadows, it'd probably be more appropriate for me to have a pair of boots on, a blue jeans, and a T-shirt or a flannel shirt, depending upon the weather. You know, what are you wearing? Today, I decided to wear a polo as opposed to the T-shirt, even though a couple of you said that T-shirt was fine. Um, I still thought I needed to dress up a little bit. So what are you wearing? And how is it taking away or, or giving to your presentation? If you're giving a presentation on a um, veterinary clinic and you're wearing scrubs, it makes sense. If you're giving a presentation on a restaurant, 
and you're wearing scrubs, it's kind of like, huh? But if you're wearing you know, a chef's outfit, then it would make more sense. So what are you wearing? Presentational aids. There's all kinds of things you can use to present with. There's multimedia. That's something they would get deluged with, especially since we are now this teaching distance learning type thing. Um, text. You could have an outline. A model. Uh, you could have uh, architects do that all the time. They build a model of the building that they're going to build so you can see what it looks like. Photographs. I've also seen photographic renderings of the building for the architect was going to show. Um, if you're talking about family history, photos of your grandparents and your great-grandparents or your kids um, would help. Uh, whitewater rafting, photos of the river high and the river low. Audio is something a lot of people don't really consider as a presentational aid because a lot of people call it visual aids. But audio is something that, that is a great tool. Uh, when I was giving a presentation in uh, my counseling grad school, I, I played this song. It's a country song. I know most of you said you didn't like country. And I'm not going to sing. Trust me, you don't want to hear me sing. But it, the, the line in it, you know, back when, in the good old days, basically he was talking about when Coke was a Coke and a hoe was a hoe, and when I'm down with that, meant that you had to flu. Um, I used that, that audio recording a little clip of it in my presentation so I could get my point across on how words change meaning over time. You know, when my mom was young, the word gay meant you were happy. Um, when I was young, the word gay was a derogatory term. And now, hopefully, in most people's eyes, it's not that such anymore. So, you know, words change over time. And audio clips sometimes maybe help you to do um, show that. We call them overhead projectors in, in the good old days, and it was a clear light and shine through up through it, and a mirror reflected on the wall, and you'd put uh, transparency on it to show show different things. Now they have computer generated to where it goes up and, and shows everything else. But you could have something like that. Flip charts. Flip charts are the big pads of paper they have on a tripod. And generally, if you're giving a presentation, you have everything drawn out on them before you start. And you start with a blank page, and you flip it up, and it tells a story, or it has a graph, or, or has a picture, whatever you want to have on it. And then you'd flip it up again for the next one. And the best thing to do with those is have a blank page between them, because you don't want to have something up there you're not talking about. Uh, whiteboards, whiteboards, smart boards we have in the classrooms all over the place. Uh, you can draw on them. Uh, some, of them some of them, like in, in our classroom that we were in, we had a whiteboard that was nothing but you just write on. Other ones have smart ones like the smart TV we have there. Um, they kind of replace chalkboards. Um, the problem that I see with those is a lot of times they don't get cleaned properly. And when they don't get cleaned properly, it, you, you get somebody else's writing on there all the time that you're trying to deal with. So that basically covers chapter 11. You know, what are you going to do when you have your presentation? You have tools to use. Um, don't, a, a little, little thing when you're using a multimedia, like, like uh, PowerPoint or something, don't turn around and read the board. We don't want to see your back. <clears throat> if you have a photo, make sure it's a big photo. You know, I've had students bring a little 8 by 10 and, and, and they can't see in the back of the room. And if you pass it around, you've lost basically three people at a minimum, maybe four. Because somebody's looking at it right now, and they're not listening to what you have to say. And when they hand it to somebody else, they're trying to catch up to where you were. Now, the next guy, he's looking at it now, so he's not listening to you. And the girl behind him is waiting for it, so give it to me, I want to see it too. And she's not listening to you. So you lose people when you pass things around. Anything you have, you need to make sure that they have good line of sight on it and that they can see it. Something that you need to worry about um, when you do use these things, and I know I said it was the end, but this, this popped into my head, is you need to have alternate methods. 
if you plan on giving a PowerPoint presentation and you get there and they don't have PowerPoint or they don't have the computer or the overhead's not working, it's going to mess you up. So you need to be prepared for more than one thing. With that said, you all have my email address. Feel free to email me. Uh, feel free to complain about or these videos. Uh, let me know how I can improve them. That's what I want to do. I want to give you the best I can give you. And since I'm not there to get feedback from you, I'm dependent upon you giving some feedback. There's no reason to, 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 to stroke my ego, although it does make me feel good. But let me know what I can do to make it better. With that said, this is the end of this video. It will be posted online. I'll post my um, keyword outline online as well. And looking forward to next time. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.